Hello again, Jules fans. Welcome back to the latest episode of Jules in the Blood TV. And of course, happy Mother's Day to all the footballing mums out there who have probably been out in the cold and the wind and the rain today watching their little ones play football. They may have been in a blustery Priestfield yesterday afternoon watching Jules do what they do, having to come from behind after being non-existent for first half and then laying siege to an opposition goal as they came back to draw one all. I am, of course, joined by co-host Reese once again. But there is no Tranmere fan this week. Obviously, with all the rigmarole and stuff going around being Mother's Day, I do have to go and see my mum in a little while when this is being recorded. Obviously, I've already been to see her now because it's now <laughs> seven o'clock in the evening. But you know what I mean. Reese. how are you? You had a good week. Yeah, I had a good week. Uh, I'm happy to be fit again. I was quite unwell last week after that Salford game. I, I was in I was in bed for most of it yeah, after I that. I did watch your um, match day live and you didn't sound uh, 100%. I won't <laughs> lie. Bless you. you were struggling there, weren't you? Struggling yeah. like us in the final third for most of the season. Yeah, sounds about right. Yeah. But I'm doing well, thank you. Good, good. Right, two o'clock Saturday afternoon is always a good starting point. And for the fourth game in a row, Jules were unchanged. <laughs> so we lined up as follows. Do I really need to tell you? Glenn Morris in goal, a back three of Conor Masterson, Maxima, Shadogi. In front of them, a quartet of Ramo Hutton, Timmy Ding, Ethan Coleman and Max Clark. And it was Johnny Williams playing as a number 10, flanking a front two of Ollie Hawkins and Ashley and Nadison. For Tranmere Rovers, it was a good old-fashioned 4-4-2. Luke McGee in goal, a back four of O'Connor, Yarny, Turnbull and Wood. And then four in front, the ever-dangerous Rob Apter, Merry Hendry and Harvey Saunders. And it was Connor Jennings and former Jill Luke Norris as a front two. Reese paragraph I've written, the very definition of a game of two halves. We again took an age to get started. Deservedly trailed at the break. Second half, everything was braver and quicker and more incisive. And the pressure eventually deservedly told. Yeah, I think that sums it up quite nicely. I think uh, if in the, if the only way you could improve that potentially in the second half, the, the mention of a kitchen sink, maybe. <laughs> That's maybe kitchen the only... sink, Alamo, <laughs> everything. It was absolutely ridiculous, wasn't it? Like yeah. we've just discussed before we press record, the amount of clips that looked the same for both of our match day lives is, is staggering. The amount of balls that were flung into their box, corners. I mean, I've got some stats for the second half or later in the show, but yeah, it just felt like one-way traffic for probably 90% of that second period. Yeah, and to, like it was the longest set of highlights I think I've had to make for one of my videos. Like genuinely, I think it actually mm. might be the longest one. It was just clip after clip after clip of, as you've described, very similar approaches. It just might be a different person crossing the ball in that time, but it looked very similar. And yeah, there was a pe few periods of play that we'll talk about that seemed to go on for such a long time, but there was no end result, as it were. Yeah, I had to delete a lot of clips out because, like I said, otherwise it would just looked like the same thing over and over, which it was. <laughs> and you want to capture that, but I think people would have said, you just put the same clip in again. <laughs> yeah. Anyway, <laughs> all the way back to the start of the first half. And, and as bad as we were, and we'll get on to that, we actually had the first chance and it was a good mm. chance as well. I think it was a Ramo Hutton free kick and he clipped it to that back post and Ollie Hawkins invariably won it, headed it back across the penalty area. Obviously, you probably had a better view than me because I was at the other end of the pitch, but Ashley Nadison is alone in the penalty area and somehow heads it wide. Is it a case of a chance that probably came too early in the game to defend Ashley? Because we will have to talk about him again. Um, what was your viewpoint on it? Because obviously you've probably got a better angle from sort of halfway line. Yeah, I think it is. It, it's a nice way to describe it as an early opportunity that maybe come too early. Um, uh, it, yeah, it just, I don't, I think uh, Nanderson's not switched on enough to get a decent connection on it. Um, and it just, it, from what, you know, it's one of those ones that he didn't get much power on it. But if he, if he had enough direction on it, it would have floated nicely into the in the top right corner. But I think uh, he probably reacted half a second too slowly. Um, but it was a, what was really promising from that is it seemed like okay, we've got we're good at set plays, put a good ball in, and okay, maybe this is a very early foundation to build upon. Which in the first half it didn't ultimately turn out to be really that. But um, it was nice to get the first opportunity. And again, should Nelson do better? Yes. It's early in the game. Is that an excuse? Mm, to to a very small certain extent, maybe. But I would also argue against you should be warmed up and alert enough to at least get something. You could argue the defence probably it was too early for them to defend something. You know, you could look at it that way as well. But yeah, we got on the front foot quickly, which was nice. We did. And then straight away, Tramia went right down the other end. And I think yeah. it was um, Harvey Saunders, their left winger, that escaped down, down the sort of the inside. I think the ball got played in between Masterson and Hutton. Or um, and then the cutback sort of was in between the centre halves and they was all off balance. I'm not sure who had the shot, but luckily he sort of passed it into the arms of Glenn Morris. But yeah, it was a very open field to the game. And within 
a minute or two, Tranmere led, unfortunately, from our point of mm. view. Now, I don't think we did a lot wrong. I think it's O'Connell, O'Connor, sorry, that the right back gets up and, and puts in a good ball. I don't think we do too much wrong. We compete for the first phase. I'm not sure if it comes off of Jennings or one of our defenders, but but we've done enough in terms of at least putting pressure on to stop him getting a good contact. From there, we just have to say fair play to, to Regan Hendry, don't we? Because it's an absolutely immaculate first touch and it's a delicious finish as well into the... Well, Glenn Morris doesn't move and Glenn Morris is a very good keeper and he just thinks, please hit the post and come out. And unfortunately, it doesn't. It hits the post and, and nestles in the back of the net. It's a great goal. It is. It is a great goal. You can't take too much away from it. I mean, you know, the amount of, I, you could say, "Oh, we should head of the ball somewhere different from from the crossing if we can." But then, in hindsight, it's a great thing. But also, at the same time, you know, like normally, those types of clearance of headers are enough in that situation. And in the percentage game, is occasionally one's going to fall to a peach of a you know a setup and a volley to go in the essentially not the post. It happens mm. occasionally. You have got to tell your half to it and go. Yeah, fair play, good finish. And yeah, it was just a it was just a tidy finish and a nice goal at the end of the day. Yeah, it is. It's a really good goal. And I think I watched the sort of the extended highlights this morning, making notes, and, and they said Hendry doesn't score many, and that's one for the scrapbook. It is. It's an absolutely brilliant hit, and you just have to go, fair play, mate. Yeah. Um, we spent then probably 10 minutes doing what we do when we when we start to struggle in games, and, and that's we, we keep it very nicely between our keeper and our back three, and then we go mm -hmm. out to our wing back, and then we go back to our centre back, and we go into Ethan Coleman and back into our centre back and across and, and nowhere. And then as soon as we were pressured or had to try and be braver and proactive and progressive with the ball, it invariably, it went out of play or we overhit it or someone had a really poor touch and couldn't bring it under control. And it just it just killed all that early momentum, if we can call it that, from an early chance. And, and we spent 15 minutes almost just, I don't know, just running around looking like we'd not played together. That was the frustrating thing from our point of view again for me. Yeah, it was pretty flat after the goal because usually we have this impetus when we go behind and uh, particularly if it's, you know, late into the first half or in the second half, that's when we usually have a little bit of fight and, well, you know, argue, we had it, Notts County went behind early, but we then got two back in that first half as well. Mm -hmm. So it was quite surprising that uh, we took a long time to get into, well, out of whatever gear we were in, <laughs> the one, I'm not sure. Uh, but it, yeah, usually when we concede, that's usually a catalyst for us to start something. Um, but it took a while uh, to get going, it was an uncharismatic approach that Gillingham Evan went behind. I, we usually have a little bit of oomph in us, but no, you're right. It was backwards and square to the goalkeeper and defence and not much happening, really. And then they had another chance, Rob Apta, who was being left one-on-one -on -one with Max Clark far too often for my liking. Yeah. We, we know how good he was in the reverse fixture at Prenton Park in November. He absolutely destroyed us. Um, and someone in a WhatsApp group that I'm in, like a League Two one, said turned into Lionel Messi again and I think my reply was he could be Lionel Blair and he'd still be good too good for us at the moment such was yeah. the <laughs> level of our performance at that point in the game it was granted the freedom of Medway it felt at times and you're just thinking just someone go and put one on him I'm not saying hurt the bloke but just go and go through him and say look you're in a game here it's not going to be easy for you but we didn't and we, we allowed him and he little I think he played a little one two didn't he and jinked across the box and luckily put it in the back of the rain I mean but it was just again that just summed up that period in the sort of 20 minutes after conceding, lethargic again. Is, is that word we use too often for first yeah. halves at Priestfield? It is a bit lethargic. And I think so. It might have been it might be Jack, actually, who said we've had 13 first halves with Clements to not much going on. I'm not scored, <laughs> yeah. It's ridiculous, isn't yeah. it? Yeah. <laughs> and, that, and that is, yeah, that, that is quite a compelling stat, actually, because... You you want a you want a team that really gets in gets in people's faces in the get go, but we seem to be a very reactive team, which you know is I don't think that's going to be that's not a champion side that's not a champion uh, team winning side. You have to be very proactive in your approach, getting people's faces, and again, particularly when you're at home, if you're given the respect of people like Rob Hapter, the freedom of Medway, that's not that's not what that's not what it's about, especially if you're at home. <laughs> so no, we should be the ones and. You know, I get that teams are going to come and sit in because we are a good side in the sense that we're still in a playoff hunt. So people are going to come and respect us and be be hard to beat. And that's up to us to then be cute enough and clever enough. But is it still Salford the last time we scored a first half goal at Priestfield in the league? Oh, my goodness. Maybe. Yes, I think so. Because the other first half goals have come from away from home, haven't they? Not County. Did we score a first half at Salford? Yeah. Not County. So Salford were away. Yet yeah, it's. Um, I was just going to look on iFollow, but my iFollow's just crashed. But I think you're absolutely right, though, and and if if it is that that is that's not great. That's not great viewing for the like the like at Priest for for the team whatsoever. 
Tranmere was last five minutes. Wrexham was second half. Stockport was goalless. Swindon were both second half in front of the Rainham end. Walsall was second half late on. Forest Green was second half in front of the yeah. Rainham end. Sutton was late on in the second half. Crawley, we didn't score. Bradford, we didn't score. Wimbledon was late second half in front of the Rainham end. So, yeah, back to Salford. It's still Salford in the league, which was three months ago when we maybe, scored the maybe, first half goal. Maybe there's a case of buying a half-season ticket, but just for second halves. <laughs> yeah, maybe we could do it by half of the game rather than half of the season. But something's yeah. got to change. It's, it's, it's a phenomenal stat for, for all the wrong reasons. Um, we then did create a modicum of a chance. I think it was it was Ramo Hutton who played a good switch out to the left-hand side and, and Shad Ogie had finally stepped out of his own half and into the the opposition territory to try and create an overload. Um, gives it to Johnny Williams. I think he stands up across and, and Ollie Hawkins gets in front of his man, but it's it's essentially a, a header back to, to Luke McGee. But it was at least signs of life and uh, signs of a heartbeat, I suppose. Um, then we had another one. Max Ema was, was bought there, well, shoved over that's it was just yeah. pushed with both hands and fair play to the ref on that occasion he tried to play an advantage there wasn't one Max Clark's really unlucky it's a great little free kick up and over and he's a width of a crossbar from level and it sort of hits the top half of the bar and, and ends up behind the goal but yeah that was two chances that I genuinely had forgot about until I started trying to do the notes for this episode which is I don't know is that a concern or maybe I'm just getting old quicker than I thought <laughs> <laughs> but it's, it's it's an interesting one. I thought the free kit was unlucky, actually, because, you know, I, I reckon mm. he puts half of those in on, on target in training. Um, uh, it's quite weird, actually, the free kick. From my perspective, when I followed the, when it at the top of the bar, the depth perception fell for me. I, I, I quite lost it. I thought it went up and was going to head back in again. It, I thought it hit, the, hit so much the angle at the top of the bar, it went upwards, but it obviously went into the prime more stand. But nonetheless, it, actually, I think we weren't great in the first half, but we were creating some stuff. I think I think I've heard people say we won't create anything in that first half. I think that's a little bit of a, a little bit unfair. We did create some stuff, uh, and we were looking to try and you know be creative as possible in that final third. Uh, obviously, it's chalk and cheese compared to the second half, but we we can't neglect uh, and you know we can't ignore the fact that we did create something of merit in the first half. I think it's just because of the lethargy of the general performance that you almost forget the good bits, don't you? So so if you look mm. at the numbers, five shots against their six. Three on target for Tramia, one on target for us. But Max Clarks is very close to being on target. So if that was two, then you're right. There's not a great deal in it. Yeah. But it's that eye test again, isn't it? We just we just looked miles off it. No, absolutely. For most of the first period, um, which was frustrating. Um, and yeah, we deservedly trailed at the break for me. Yeah, but well, I think you're absolutely right. I deserve the trail at the break. And uh, I'm sure there are a couple of Tramia fans, if not all the ones in Priestfield thinking... Actually, why haven't we scored two? <laughs> you know, they've they probably felt like they could have got a second goal and all of that and, and been much more comfortable. Yeah, because Apter had, I think, one chance right at the end of the half as well, where he's jinked yeah. inside and he sort of tried to whip it far post and it's it's just not curled enough, luckily, from our point of mm. view. But fair play to Stephen Clements, because we were mm. sitting there at half time and said, we've got to make changes. Like I could understand, because I know there was the question marks about the rotation on Tuesday obviously with only two days between Salford and Barrow, but I didn't have any issue with the same 11, given the fact that we'd had a week essentially from Tuesday, well, four days from Tuesday to Saturday, because this is a side that was very good at, against Stockport, Salford and Wrexham. So I didn't have an issue. It was just the fact that there was probably half of them were, were well off the pace, which was causing us a massive issue. So I was happy that there were changes and that Stephen Clements was proactive at the break. Ashley Nadison. Rinse and repeat, unfortunately. Um, I don't want to dig him out, but he just, as soon as he missed that header early on for me, it just looked like the confidence just drained out of him again. And then he, I don't know, he couldn't trap a bag of sand for the rest of the half, unfortunately. Um, no. He was withdrawn, Shad Ogie was withdrawn, and we bought on George Lapsley and Conor Mahoney, and we went to a 4 4 1 1. What did you make of the changes? I thought I thought they were very impressive, not in terms of what they did in the game, and we'll get to that, but just the fact that we went right. Let's go and have a go. If we get beat 2 0, so be it. But let's be seen to be trying to make things happen. Similar to the Swindon game a few weeks ago. I think that, um, I think Clemens was forced into those changes in the context of what happened at Barrow potentially as well. Mm -hmm. I think it's maybe, uh, maybe it's, it's this idea of trying to be more of a more proactive your approach, actually change it half time and give Tramir other things to think about and bring on some fresh legs. Uh, so for me, 
uh, I give credit to the changes that Clem has made. Absolutely. Uh, it had to be done. That's the, that's the thing about it. If it wasn't done, we wait the 60 minutes. By that point, either the game's flat and nothing happens and Tramway have done their job or they go nick a second. So I think just to, to sort of uh, to rejuvenate the whole second half period, I think those changes Because the worst thing it does pinnacle. is it gets the crowd up, doesn't it? Yeah. That's the worst thing, that the minimum that happens when you go, oh, he's made a couple of changes. Oh, we've got more attacking players on the pitch. So at least yep. the Rainer men goes and then the rest of the crowd goes. And that was what happened. And I think Boz laughed after about three minutes of the second. Well, he might not have been joking. And he said, Conor Mahoney's my man of the match. <laughs> Such was yeah. the performance yeah. first period. that Because he was straight away, wanted the ball. He was going yep. on the outside. He was going on the inside. And he created himself half a chance within about a minute or so. That, that Luke McGee had to get his hands up and just palm it away. Um, then there was another chance for Ollie Hawkins. Max Clark, good delivery from the left-hand side. Hawkins, again, gets away from his man, but misses the target when he should be heading yeah. it under the crossbar. Um, but there was signs of life um, and sustained life this time, wasn't it? Um, first half, you just felt like it was sort of like CPR. Oh, no, he's gone. Bless him. <laughs> Whereas this time you thought that there was something, there was a proper recovery happening. Yeah. Um, and yeah, it was good. The rain of men were up, like you say. What did you make of the atmosphere? Because because I've watched a couple of bits this morning. You could hear it second half. You could hear that noise. Whereas first half, it was just absolute silence. You made a really good point. That, that, that Those substitutions within the first few minutes of that half, you could hear the atmosphere. It was ele electrics are actually... Yeah, is the right word to use. Because there was a couple of moments. It just it takes a, a run from Mahoney and, and one opportunity... And everyone's like, right, actually, we could do this. We can get back into this. And and suddenly we become the home team again. And that was, I felt that, as it were, like audibly through, um, through I follow, absolutely. Um, and, and and I think that it runs true because when I'm doing my video as well, it, that kind of gets me up and going as well. And I'm, mm. I'm much more uh, invested in it, as it were. So, um, it does, it, it affects you ever. Wherever you're watching yeah. it, it affects you. Like if you're watching it on the telly, you go from sort of, slumped in your seat to sort of on the edge of your seat or yep. the same in the rain amend or you'll be trying to stand up because everyone else in front of you standing up for a corner or something like that it has that domino effect and we've mentioned atmosphere and who's responsible for it in previous episodes haven't we we've got this whole last waltz thing which i think is absolutely brilliant it's it's mm. sort of it makes the hairs on your arm stand up and it did again yesterday before the game but the players have a responsibility to give us something to cheer about as well so it's almost chicken and egg yep. um which one comes first? No one ever seems to know, unfortunately. <laughs> we then had another chance. And don't adjust your sets here, Jules fans, because I am going to say some words that, that may not be entirely familiar to us. We steal the possession deep in our own half and then we break quickly. Yes, I said that correctly. We break quickly at pace. Max Clark plays a lovely ball into the channel up to Ollie Hawkins, who has an unbelievably good first touch on his chest. Spins his man, rolls it into Jules Lapsley, who's galloping on from the halfway line. I think if you watch the highlights, you can see that Conor Mahoney's absolutely busting a gut, which again was something we didn't see first period from anyone to try and get on the outside. Lapsley slides him in. Mahoney does pretty much everything right. I think there's a little debate as to whether it's actually going inside the far post, but it's brilliant defending from the Tramia defender because he doesn't know and he has to get back and, and sort of lump it over his own bar from, from point blank range. But in terms of a passage of play, that's what we can do quickly. So it always comes back to why don't we do it more? It's a really good question. And, and it's because that patch of play, it, it, and also it's one of those patches of play that get the crowd involved. The crowd play a part in that as well, mm -hmm. because they try, they try and bring that one home themselves. Mm -hmm. And, 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 and because that's one of those ones, if you then, if Mahoney decides to take his time and slow the tempo down, the crowd get frustrated and then the pressure's on, you lose a bit of confidence and it's gone. Which is what was happening first half. We'd get yes. into a good position. We'd stop. We'd come back inside and go square into traffic, and then you lose all that momentum and forward. Exactly well, yeah, momentum. Exactly that. And also with that kind of of momentum going forward, it makes defence have to make decisions much quicker. Mm -hmm. They're more likely. They're more at risk to make a mistake, and that's how you could create clearer opportunities as a, as, as a forward line. So for me, it's that is that that quickness in a in attack that we've been missing so much this season that when we do have those opportunities, we're a much more dangerous team. And and, and it's like, this is why we, we even though we seen Otardo over a couple of games, that's why we miss someone like that, because he has that kind of, that, that effect on the game. He can do things quickly and, and it makes everyone have to make decisions which they happen to do really quickly. And there is when defensive risk increases and you have a more dangerous opportunity going forward. And that that break of play really exposed that, uh, that, that type of play that we've been missing for a lot of this season. Fearless, that's the word I'd use. 
Yeah. That passage of play, we yeah. played without fear. We wasn't worried. Everything was instinctive. No one was slowing down. Everyone had a good touch, laid it off. Everyone wanted the ball. Too often we see, like I say, we get to a certain point on the pitch and then we go, do we trust ourselves? Do we trust our teammates? And it all falls down. At this point, it felt like kitchen sink, as you referred to, yeah. Alamo. <laughs> it was just constant wave after wave of attack from Gillingham, it felt like. So I have put in, just so that, that Tranmere are aware that they're still in this game. They did have a half chance. They played a free kick into our box and it fell to, I think, Jordan Turnbull, the centre-half, who, who span and shot straight at Glenn Morris. But that was essentially it until right at the end, which we'll get to. Um, their defending is, is, is brilliant, to be fair, though, Tranmere. Every time a ball came into their box, well, aside from one or two, I think we've mentioned the Hawkins chance where he gets away from his man too easily. But like we've said before, if you can't win that contact, make it hard for the attacker. They were doing that. Any shots, yep. they were throwing themselves in front of it. They were willing to take the proverbial one for the team. And there was probably a little bit of play acting with that. And I got really frustrated during the game with the referee and, and their players. But if we were doing it and one nil up, I'd understand it entirely. So with the benefit of a day's sleep, um, you can see what they were doing. There was a couple went down with cramp um, <laughs> and a pulled hamstring. That one made me laugh. Luke McGee was struggling with a pulled hamstring and then 30 seconds later was able to whack a, a goal kick 80 yards up the pitch. Yeah. Um, but no, everything that came into their box, they was competing with and, and heading clear and blocking and, and making it difficult for us as good as we were in that second period. Um, we then rolled the dice again, Reese. Um Max Clark sacrificed for... Scott Malone, which I had no issue with. I think Scott Malone's more suited to a 4-4-2 or a back four, I think, whereas Max Clark's the better wing-back of the two. Ethan Coleman, who'd had another dodgy yeah. game, I think it's fair to say, was on a booking for a long time as well, which probably didn't help. They were taken off. Scott Malone came on and Josh Walker, and we went to a, a proper 4-4-2. And we were fairly attack-minded in the middle in terms of we didn't have a natural hold. It was Timmy Dieng and, and George Lapsley who both want to be box-to-box so again, it comes back to that. Let's have a go. If we lose 2 0, so be it. But let's be seen to be trying to make things happen. Um, another chance. Um, who was our joint top scorer at the time, Connor Masterson, was doing what we wanted him to do first off, stepping into midfield. He proper catches that effort from about 25 what? yards. And you, you could hear it whistling as it comes towards the rain. I mean, unfortunately, it's probably three or four foot wide. Um, but it was intent again. Um, and, and that was something that was that was pleasing me second half. Yeah, that, that shot you alluded to. Uh, oh, I follow. You never know until it's the back of the rain if it's gone in or not. <laughs> you no, have no idea. He, caught so it, I, he proper caught it, didn't he, as well? Oh, it did like he? a scuff or a shin or anything like that. And 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 McGee had a, had a stance of a goalkeeper that looked like he wasn't sure if that was going in or not. So uh, that's I why I said, similar to the Morris one, he knows if that's on target, I'm getting absolutely nowhere near it. So I'm just absolutely. saying that it goes the wrong side of the post. Absolutely. I just um, and also just I just want to give Tramir a bit of credit as well. I, think there's my, mm -hmm. I don't know if you've got to that point yet. There's a chance that um that Aptabri skied it over the bar, I think, earlier in that second half as well. Um when it went across the box. And 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 that was another moment where you thought Tramby could actually get us on the break quite often. That was kind of how they were set up to oh, play. Oh yes, I, I do remember that one. Got underneath yeah. it, almost like pitching where yep. it ended up sort of yeah. I think it went out yeah. for throwing. Something weird like that, yeah, yeah. But it, but yeah, there was there's a couple. That, what I thought of Tra even though even though Tramble were quite compact, as you say, and we and we sometimes had to take a long shot through Masterson, that they were they were prepared to counter us. That was kind of their game plan, albeit very compact in the in the area uh, when we were trying to to get to break them down. They they have defended and blocked excellently well for that patch to play, um, and they were putting bodies on the line left, right, and centre. And you have to give credit to that. Uh, but they, I think, they were quite poised to have a go at counter attacks as well, and that was one that was their that was their threat for the second half. Absolutely, and I think if you'd watched the game as someone who didn't know about Gillingham and Tranmere, you wouldn't say Tranmere were a team that had only won eleven points on the road this season. They played no. with the confidence that belied mm. their away form. I thought. That's probably something to do with us and how poor we were first half as well. And then I get they've had to dig in in the second period. But in Rob Apter, they've always got an outlet and they've always got a threat and someone that can carry the ball up the pitch, which I suppose I like for like is, is Mr Mahoney. And we'll talk about him at the end of the, once we've got through the timeline. Um, but yeah, I remember the chance now. You've brought that one up and uh, they had another good one towards the end, I think, but albeit the flag had already gone up. But yeah. but we, we then equalised and I... I it was deserved at that point because we'd had 80, 90% of the second half. 
really good build up again, if I remember rightly. I think Josh Walker, who's been much maligned over recent weeks as well. I think he does really well initially. The ball sort of bounces out of the sky from a sort of clearance and he gets his body between the man and the mm. ball and manages to get it under control and gets, I think it's Connor Mahoney or Hutton are both involved. And then Mahoney forces the corner. But if if Josh Walker doesn't have that good touch and that first phase of play doesn't happen, we don't then earn the corner. From there, we know what Connor Mahoney's delivery is like from a set play. It's absolutely ridiculous. Mm-hmm. Connor Masterson arrives like an absolute express train. <laughs> And it's one of them where you just hear the, as he's yeah. four, it's not a side of the head. That's right slap bang in the middle of his forehead. And I think if it, it Luke McGee, Luke McGee goes in with it all, to be honest, it's a brilliant header. Um, and suddenly we've got five minutes to try and find a winner. Yeah, it was a great head. I when he, when he got on the end, it happened so quickly. I thought, I thought, all the, I, it's so hard. I thought the goal was going to fall down. Like it really clattered it. <laughs> it really hit the I net. I love headers like that where they don't even yeah. bounce. It just it's that, <laughs> it just, it's the t- back of the net and just sort of slides down the back of it, sort of sympathetically because it thinks, oh, I've been hurt here. The football. Yeah, right. Absolutely. <laughs> like a it's, cartoon, it's, like when a cartoon and, the, and the, like a bird flies into a window. Yeah. <laughs> it's, it had that kind, had that kind of effect, but it, it's it, yeah, it, it was it was a great header, and, and it, it was such, it's, its connection was almost like in the middle of a cricket bat. That's kind of how it felt, yeah, and that was it. Yeah, I, it, I could it was, feel it. You mid- <laughs> he absolutely middled it. Yeah, that's a great yeah. analogy. To be fair, something that the England Test team have not done much of over the last no. few Test matches, but that's for another show. I'm sure there are plenty of good cricket podcasts out there that you can go and listen to. <laughs> but yeah, but it, but this yeah, we're five minutes to go. Great goal. We got the rain men up and. By goal, did we did we have a good go at it, to be fair? I think it's fair to say. I think we did. I think there was another chance um, for Ollie Hawkins again. No, I think there was one before that. Johnny Williams done really well to escape a couple of challenges and unfortunately just sort of cut across it and it ended up drifting into the rain of men. But again, it was... How often have we spoken about we don't shoot from the edge of the box? We must have shot more from the edge of the box yesterday than we have combined <laughs> for the rest of our season. So, like, unfortunately, yeah. everything was either off target or got blocked at source but there was a willingness and an intent to try something slightly different because if you watch games as a scout for us you're saying they don't shoot from the edge of the box so get into your six yard line and just defend it when it comes in yeah um but carry on no i was gonna say now that you're absolutely right with that and it's it was quite refreshing for us to see us having to go from a bit of distance actually and give a give McGee something to think about you know and and one of the things I like about sometimes long range shooting occasionally is like you know one one maybe one in every twenty is going to ping in the top corner regardless. Mm. That's law of statistics. It's going to happen. It could be anyone that's on the end of it. I mean, it could be Morris. You know, it, yep. it's going to go at some point. But the, I think what what a long shot does if it's close or if it's you know with some some oomph, that's enough to sometimes get the crowd on board again. And it goes back to the idea of how important it is to have the crowd on the side and to really get involved with the game because that can boost the confidence in the whole team and play fearlessly, as you've described. Um, And that can all be uh, started from, you know, just from a long shot from 35 yards that just goes four foot wide, for instance. Mm -hmm. And uh, so I think that, I think it's an important thing to consider is that long shots have big parts to play in games, even if they're, they don't result in a goal. It could be the start of something new. And also how many times you see someone shoots from the edge of the box and it takes a huge nick off a centre half and ends up wrong footing the keeper and goes in. It's, you know, it's the old adage, isn't it? You, you can't win a prize unless you buy a raffle ticket. So exactly. just buy more raffle tickets. <laughs> yeah, easy. <laughs> Simple. Playoffs, here we come. <laughs> <laughs> raffle tickets. <laughs> Another chance, well, for Ollie Hawkins. Uh, Connor Mahoney, obviously, was at the heart of it again. Looks like he's going to go right, goes left, clips it up. Ollie Hawkins, I don't think, does a lot wrong. It's a glancing header and it misses the far post by probably a foot. But that unfortunately just summed up Ollie's day. It was very much a nearly day for Ollie Hawkins in terms of chances that he was getting on the end of. He could have had three or four on another day if, if luck was on his side or if he'd just been a little bit more clinical. Um, and I think I said to Boz during the game, I said, these are the chances you have to take if you want to be in the top three, the top seven. Yeah. Nine, nine I think... games to go. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But with, I just want to add actually with with Hawkins there, like it, it was it was one of those nearly games for him. I think you pretty much to summarize what you said. One of those yeah. nearly games where I he was always in, he was in the right place at the right time, doing the right things. But just, I mean, some would argue if you believe in luck, don't believe in luck. You make your own luck. But I didn't think it was just it just didn't quite fall for him really. This game he was doing a lot of good stuff. And it just didn't quite no, work out. No, it looked out. like he'd um, reversed over a cat. 
on his way yeah. to the ground. That's what it felt like. He was destined to just not score, unfortunately. And he did a lot right, like you say. He was involved in a lot of good build-up play for chances created, like the Mahoney one that was cleared off the line. It's him that initially brings the clearance under control and gets us yep. on our way. So he did a lot right again. And he's he certainly made us a better football team since he's come back. Um, but yeah, I think he could have been out there till midnight and it probably wouldn't have gone in for him. <laughs> Regan Hendry, who'd obviously scored that wonderful goal at the start of the game, then hit a post in injury yeah. time. Um, but it was flagged for offside, so we could all breathe. He's very unlucky to be fair. It's a brilliant first touch. That's why I put it in, even though it was it was something that wouldn't have counted. The first touch, to just bring it under control instantly, was was absolutely spot on. Probably as good as his touch for the first goal. Um, but luckily, the lino was, was on our side and it wouldn't have counted. And then the big moment that I think was probably more contentious at the time than it actually needed to be. Um, Timmy Dieng, I'm talking about, wheels off in front of a rain of men that's just about to blow the roof off, I think. Only yeah. for a linesman's flag and a referee's whistle to ruin our Saturday afternoon, but correctly ruin our Saturday afternoon, I think. Yeah. For me, there's two handballs. And I've seen a few posts on on social media saying, well, he's not given handballs during the game, so why is he given this one? That doesn't matter, unfortunately. No, doesn't matter. And I, I get the sentiment because there was a lot of stuff that, that didn't get given, but that was for both sides. But as I think I laughed at Boz and said, I think to get Anne Ball in this, you've either got to, you've got to catch it and shove it up your shirt and run around with it because that's what it <laughs> felt like at points in the game. But the ball comes in from our left-hand side initially, and I've seen various angles of eye follow and, and fan content. I think there's been one that's been high in the rain amend. There's one that's from the front row of the rain amend. For me, when Timmy Dieng tries to flick it around the first man, he pats it down with his forearm. Mm. And then when it's cleared, it smashes him in the hand, which if it doesn't, it ends up in the medway stand. So there's no way that that goal can be allowed to stand, no? No, it can't stand. And by, no. by the letter of the law as well, it can't stand because any goal that is uh, scored that has a handball within it somewhere yeah. uh, is is a foul, regardless of it was accidental or not. Yeah. It doesn't matter. Which is the discussion we've had before about why does it have to be... So if it's an attacker, if it's any type of touch, you're penalised. But if it's a defender, it has to be a touch on purpose to be penalised. But that's for a different podcast as yeah. well. Um, and we're a long way away from having to talk about VAR regularly at the moment. But Which for me, it's it's the right decision. There's no way you Yeah, can... 100%. Put it this 100%. way, if you ask 100 Jills fans, if that was Connor Jennings doing that in the other box and Tranmere go 2-1 up, we're all going absolutely ballistic if it stood. That's yeah, oh, absolutely. The question. Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, yeah, I mean, the... the letter that all says that can't stand, regardless of what's happened before or what will happen after that moment. He a got massive that one right. in the arse, though, wouldn't it? Because it'd have been that yeah. rain of men. I think that the roof may have come off if that had yeah. been allowed to stand. Because it would have absolutely. been absolutely. Well, yeah, it was like ninety fifth minute or something ridiculous. But yeah, it was pretty much the last play of that game, almost, wasn't it? So it sucks. It, it's a, it's a real it's a real kick in the groin. I think that one when you, when you don't realise that's going to count. It's always a, a bad feeling, and uh, yeah. But unfortunately, uh, it, oh, ref, unfortunately for Tram, it's the right decision. Right. Yeah, you he know, did. I said it. The ref got it right. There you go. Frame that one, Jules fan. Save Clip that. that. Exactly. Yeah. Wait, make that one. Tenth of March, oh nine thirteen at time of recording. Matt agreed with the referee. Um, full time. I didn't really know how to feel because it felt like a poor performance because of the first half. It felt like we could have won the second half. I th what I think what I'm trying to say is, if based on the second half, if we'd nicked a second, I don't think anyone could argue that we didn't deserve the points. But you'd have felt for Tranmere as a neutral mm. because they were better than us first period. So that was the disappointment. You then feel flat because it's a team that have been generally rubbish away from home. Then you look at the league table and go, oh, Walsall have lost, Morecambe have lost, Crewe have got beat. We're back in the playoffs. Yeah. But Bradford have won and they've got two games in hand and Crawley have won. And they. I generally didn't know how to feel at full time because we were back in the playoffs. But... We could end up 11th or something if all the teams below us win their games in hand. And Tuesday is absolutely massive now. Yeah, it's it. Well, I think that probably describes the the, the chaotic nature of League Two football, doesn't it? <laughs> That's what You're that... probably right. And the afternoon as a whole, to be fair, yeah. Yeah, I mean, I, I've I've got an idea here that maybe there's a certain element that says Tranmere are probably one of the very few teams of division that haven't got anything to play for at the moment. And I don't know if that yeah. is that adds any factor into this their their approach yesterday. No idea. You know, if they had if they were batting relegation, would they have? Would they have? try to get more, you know, or if they're in the same position as us, what type of game would it be? Would it be cagey, more or expensive? Or would they have been more nervous? It's, yep. There's so many different sort of caveats to it, isn't it? So like exactly. you say, you just have to take it at face value and try and win the football match. 
Um, we're seven unbeaten at home. We've not been beat at the Priestfield since uh, Boxing Day when Crawley turned us over quite easily. But in that time, it's only two wins. We've beaten Wrexham and we've beaten Sutton. And there's been draws against Forest Green, Walsall, Swindon, Stockport and Tranmere. So quick calculation says six, 11 points from 21, which is not awful. But could it ultimately come back and bite us on the backside come the final reckoning? Yeah, I think it could. Too many draws. Considering, considering we've had seasons previously, and I'm going back quite far as well, like Nord's years as well, where our home form has been the reason we've been pushing promotional playoffs mm -hmm. because our away form has been poor. I mean, I remember one season where we, I think we we just stayed up in League One, where we won, we were the best third best home record in the league, and I then away, the worst then. away record in the whole league as well. So. It's interesting to see a Gillingham team that is performing better away from home throughout the season compared to at home, where we should be doing better. Anyway, I don't know if that's exactly right. We actually are better at home. Let me just have but... a look and see if I can work out our last seven away quickly. Talk yeah. amongst yourself. <laughs> I'll talk to myself. <laughs> but but whilst, you're, whilst you're searching that statistic or that well, piece of information, what I, well, what I can add to that is it doesn't feel like a... like. If we nick it yesterday, it, it feels like it's a justified home win because that's kind of how it is. But we're not doing that at home. We're kind of suddenly drawing lots at home. And it's always, that's what the away team normally wants when they go away is to try and nick a draw more often than not. And we're uh, giving concessions to teams by allowing that to happen, by not being the home team and getting on the front foot to try and get that winner. We've got 12 points from our last seven away okay. from home and 11 points from our last seven at home. So it's just... So when you break it down like that, it's not too different. So, so what's yeah. the better way? Of, of course, more points. But the confidence is bred from, you know, not losing football matches as well. Yeah, so essentially away from home, our last seven is lost one, lost one, lost one, one. Yeah. So four wins, three defeats. So it's, again, we're pretty much at the same point. It's just the perception of how you're getting to that point. So maybe the home form's <laughs> not as bad as we're, we're trying to say here, isn't it? But again, there's some frustrating draws. I, yeah. Forest Green will be a team that we're going to absolutely hate if if we do end up missing out by a point or two because we've only taken two points off them. I get the Stockport draw was a good draw. Swindon frustrating because you led with a minute to go. So there's been some good draws and there's been some bad draws in that run. Um, one person who I think could change some of them draws into more wins would be Conor Mahoney. And we have to talk about him because that was one of the best 45 minutes I've seen from an individual in the last few months yeah. from a Gillingham point of respect. Just by it. Considering how we know what our issues are and we say that so often we're not brave enough, he literally just came on and went, I'm going to grab this game by the scruff of the neck. I'm going to keep wanting the ball. I'm going to drive at people. I'm going to get balls into the box. I'm going to shoot on sight. I'm going to set up a goal, essentially. Um, he is our best creative force for me. And on that, do we have to find a way and find a system that gets Conor Mahoney into the side from the off? I agree. That is it. That's what we need. Because when he got that ball yesterday, it just the, it, when it got to him, you knew something was going to happen. It That's felt like earlier, something was happening. You went from yeah. being like that to being yeah. like that. Exactly. And and that's and you need that in a play. And and I I don't you know we need to have him doing that the whole game. We can't have him do that in the second half or him to go out of the game, hide and then come back into the game. We need when the ball gets to like when the ball went to Rob Apter, something was going to happen. <laughs> you knew it. And it's going to happen. What it felt like second half when Conor Mahoney was introduced. Yeah. And, and so, but we need that throughout the duration of the game or from the majority of the game, because without that, I I think we're going to be one of these nearly teams as a result of that. And, mm -hmm. and we need to find a system where Mahoney does, is be is will be able to play how he did at that second half yesterday for the majority of the game. We need to get that system somehow, particularly for the last running of this of this season. Yeah, again, because it comes back, I'd rather us have a real go. And if we come up short having a real go, then so be it. But yeah. I don't want us to just drift through games, waste halves, waste hours, and then have to play catch up. So, okay. Conor Mahoney's best position is, tell me. Oh, well, yesterday he, he was he was. Working it down the right hand side was almost like a right winger, wasn't he? That mm -hmm. was kind of where he was pushing out towards. So, so, uh, so attacking midfield, a right sort of right winger influence because he has the ability to cut in and shoot on his left foot and on his or go out wide, shoot on his right foot, or to put it across the box. So for me, anywhere out on that width is for me his his strongest position. So next question, team for Tuesday. 
<laughs> I've got mine. I've I've made mine. I'd make a couple of I've made one, two, three changes. You made three. But you've and caught I've changed, me on... and I and I've changed the system. Okay. You've caught me. I don't I don't know about you've caught me about I'll tell you what person I would change. Um mm. Uh, this is off the cuff here. I've not really thought this through, so this comes out a bit skew with. Well, do, uh, do you want me to say what I've gone with? And um, then you can sort of work it from there, or I'll tell you what. I'll give you my I'll give you my obvious one that yeah. I think I would like to see Nadison switch off. I would like to him swaps. I would like to see Walker start again. Actually, I don't. I, okay. I'd not I'd like to see him start. I think he, he deserves that after his second half performance yesterday. And I would maybe mm, may oh, I can't decide, but I want I want Mahoney to start. I don't know whether it's going to be Coleman's play poor recently, but I think that would be an unfair change. Wouldn't work. But Mahoney needs to be on there somewhere. But I don't know who to switch for. Maybe you can continue it there, and I can see if I agree I've with you. I've gone not. Ben Morrison goal. <laughs> yeah, I would give Max Clark a rest, and that's not because he's done anything wrong. But I think Scott Malone's better yep. suited to a back four, which I think we could switch to. But yep. again, it's the caveat is we're away from home. So whether Stephen Clements thinks reverting to a a braver system away from home would be the sensible thing. I'm not sure, but I'd go Scott Malone left back, Connor Masterson and Max Emer in the middle and Romeo Hutton at right back. I'd then keep the two middle, Ethan Coleman and Timmy Dieng. Yeah. I think Ethan's been too good throughout the season that I think he's allowed one or two where he's been off the pace. Um, the three in front would be George Lapsley, who I thought was very good when he came on as well yesterday. Connor yeah. Mahoney and Johnny Williams. Now my thought yeah. process here is I know people are going to go, well, you're going to have to shunt Johnny out to the left. But such is the ability of Conor Mahoney to play either side. You could keep making that free fluid. So you could have Mahoney right, Lapsley in the middle, Williams in the uh, from the left. Or you could go switch Mahoney to the right, to the left, shunt George Lapsley out and then put Johnny Williams in the 10 as well. So there's fluidity in that. And then I'd have Ollie Hawkins up front. So 4-4-1-1 four, four, one, one, essentially for me. I like what Josh Walker did, but I'm... I just think that him and Nadison, in terms of confidence level starting at the moment, is risky. And I know I'm going yeah. against everything I said two episodes ago where I said we've got to give this partnership a chance. But unfortunately for me, Ashley Nadison regressed massively again yesterday afternoon. As soon as he missed that chance, he just looked like not he didn't want to be out there. And I'm not and he certainly worked hard, but he just, like I say, couldn't pass, he couldn't control it. We can't afford to be carrying people, no. would be my no. point at this stage of the season. That's right. Just to go back, if we kept the same system as we did starting against Tranmere, I think uh, if we could have two up top, I, mean, I would put Walker on as an analyst, and that would be my, that's the reason yeah, why I, I think justified so, yeah. that. So if we did play a back three, obviously Ogie would stay in. You then probably struggle to find a place for, well, you Mahoney. essentially you can't play Mahoney, Lapsley no. and Williams in a 3 5 two, can you? Which is why when I looked at the, look, I was just looking at the formation from yesterday, that's why I struggled to put him in, because I don't want to put Dick and Coleman out, and I don't want to mm -hmm. Williams out. So I think going four at the back, is the best way forward if we were to try and get Mahoney into a system that works. And I think the fluidity of the front three that you suggest with Williams, Lapsley and Mahoney will give Wimbledon a tricky job to mark, to manage and to keep on. It will keep them on their toes. Therefore, the risk of them making mistakes are higher. And I think that could work. I'm just might be the, there and could be the birth of creativity as well. Oh, I'm doing a preview show. I never done one of those before. I know, we're doing everything this morning, <laughs> aren't we? Oh. Should start yeah. charging a patron, shouldn't we? I think we should. No. <laughs> Joking. Don't unsubscribe. No. I no. won't ever charge you. It's all free. I promise. We love you all. Uh, <laughs> I'm just looking at Wimbledon's match from the weekend, because obviously they was impressive beating uh, Notts County, and they lined up. See, they line up with the back three. So I think Stephen Clements will match up, to be quite honest. So yeah. just, just ignore what we just said for the last 10 minutes. But it's certainly something to look forward to in terms of a home, a home system, I think, against yeah. Grimsby maybe next week. Yeah, and and interestingly, and, and, and look, looking that far ahead, if we can get a result at Wimbledon again, every game's important now. But Grimsby coming to the priest field, you know, it's. Uh, I think you've got to go if you again draw draw away win at home. We're going to be right in the mix, aren't we? Yeah, so two points a game would so two points a game from nine gives us eighteen, takes us to seventy three. I think that's enough. I think seventy one could be enough, but it's just yeah. Um, wet. I don't want it's, to start trying to predict it no, too much. But for what it's worth, Matt, if I was to put a prediction now, I think it's going to go down to the last game. That's I said what that. I think. I've gone from being... Don't cast the home. All it's going to be there. I'm going to go sick because of that's what I said pre-season. I then said to Gabe a few weeks ago, Gabe Sutton, I think we'd drop out. And now I'm... I can't see it not going to right to the final day against Doncaster. And I think we're all going to end up with no fingernails come five o'clock on yep. the last Saturday in April. Agreed. It's <laughs> probably a good place to wrap it up.
think so. <laughs> as always, massive thanks to Reese. Really enjoy talking to him about everything Jills. As also a big thanks to everyone that is still listening at this point, whether you are a Jills fan or a Tramia fan. Thank you very much. Please keep liking all of our videos. Please keep hitting that subscribe button, turning that bell on so you get notifications for all new content. We will be back Wednesday. I do already have a Grimsby guest sorted out, so we will be preparing another big game ahead of next weekend. And of course, I will be at Plough Lane on Tuesday evening for another match day live in what is an absolutely huge game for Stephen Clements' Gillingham as they take on fellow playoff chasing side Wimbledon. Bit of a bogey side in recent years, but records are there to be broken. So fingers crossed we can get a positive result and head into the weekend with a bit of confidence. But until then, to all you mums, I hope you've had a lovely Mother's Day. To the rest of you, I hope you've had a nice weekend. And up the jewels. <laughs>